speaker? Or? Yes, just adjust it. So this is more convenient yeah. time. Right, right, right. right. Including many circumstances here, taking sure, into sure. account many circumstances here. Right, right, right. Hello and good evening. It is very fortunate case that we continue the inspiring online seminar series of Tubitak Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences, which we organize for national and international audiences to mitigate the negative impacts of COVID-19 situation in the world on scientific thought and its cre creation. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you for this occasion of our interdisciplinary seminar series. All of you joining us through the Zoom platform and all of you watching us through all social media platforms of TÜBİTAK, the Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey. It is also my distinct pleasure to introduce you our tonight's very special speaker. Professor Achilles Kapanidis from the University of Oxford is going to give a great talk entitled Unlocking Gene Expression Mechanisms and Detecting Viruses via Single Molecule Imaging. At the end of the talk, we will have a question answer session where questions can be asked by sending a message through chat button of, Zoom, of the Zoom platform or just by raising hand. Achilles Kapanidis is a professor at the Department of Physics of Oxford University. After completing a degree in chemistry at the Aristotelian University of Thessaloniki, Greece, Achilles Kapanidis obtained a master degree in food chemistry and his PhD degree in biological chemistry, both at the Rutgers University, New Jersey, USA. After holding research scientific scientist positions in a single molecule biophysics at Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and University of California, Los Angeles, he started a research group as a senior lecturer at Oxford University in 2005 and became a professor of biological physics in 2013. In 2011, Professor Kapanidis became a fellow of the European Research Council. And in 2016, he became a welcome trust investigator. Professor Kapanidis is currently leading a group of phys physical and biological scientists known as the Gene Machines Group. The group studies biological machinery involved in gene expression maintains regulation, focusing mainly on gene transcription and DNA repair. The main tool of the group is single molecule fluorescence, fluorescence microscopy, a technique that measures nanometric distances and molecular interactions in real time, in vitro and in living cells. The work of group is multidisciplinary, combine optics, photonics, imaging, biochemistry, molecular biology, modeling, and signal processing. With this, I want to thank once again, Professor Achilles Kapanidis for joining us for this seminar. We are really looking forward to it. Achilles, you're welcome Thanks, to uh, yeah. your talk, please. Thank you, thank you for your kind uh, introduction, uh, Alkram. It's a pleasure to be part of your uh, series. Thanks for reaching out, and in these very difficult times for the entire uh, planet, and of course for our countries, um, to actually have the opportunity to discuss uh, our work with uh, colleagues in in Turkey and start a, a positive uh, relation that I can uh, also continue with uh, with time. So um, let me share my my slides. Uh, to start the talk, I'll share the screen. Hopefully, oops, uh, share the screen. Okay. Hopefully, 
hopefully you'll be able to see my uh, first page. Okay, that's great. Okay, so I hope you can see um, the, perfect. the first page. Okay, fantastic, perfect. fantastic. All right. Um, so, so today I'll be um, telling you um, a, a few of our uh, latest uh, stories on uh, the use of uh, single molecule uh, uh, detection, the ability to... Achilles, I am sorry, but bottom yes. of the page is not seen indeed. Oh, okay. That's... Uh... Let's see where we can fix this. So you cannot see it, the date or? Yeah, uh, uh, bottom there's a line. I see, I guess that there's a line. Do you see the online, sem do you see online seminar? Uh, not, seen, not seen indeed. Ah, okay. All right, that was not good. Uh, let's uh, try this again. Oh, okay. Now, Okay, oh, you see it now? Oh, oh I think maybe the, the screen. You should is share the screen again. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Does it work better? No, it is perfect, really. Okay, fantastic. All right. Okay, after this uh, false start, let's let's continue. And uh, yes, today I'll be telling you how we use the power of being able to uh, image individual uh, uh, molecules, uh, fluorescent molecules, to look at um, uh, biological mechanisms that are centered uh, around uh, gene expression, the process that takes us from the level of DNA to the level of, uh, of proteins. And I uh, will be discussing about uh, uh, the mechanisms that uh, allow the RNA polymers, the machine that copies DNA into RNA, to open the, the DNA in order to read uh, the information uh, that is stored in genes, and also how we can uh, use uh, the ability to detect single molecules to be able to follow single molecules as they perform their function inside living bacterial cells, and then how these uh, methods can be repurposed to actually um, detect uh, viruses, including for coronavirus, very rapidly and specifically. So uh, we have an interdisciplinary group uh, at Oxford that uh, makes uh, this work uh, possible. Again, physical and biological uh, scientists uh, work together to study the machinery of gene expression and, and DNA repair. We're focusing uh, in particular on uh, the workings of uh, nucleic acid uh, polymerases. And as uh, I mentioned to you, the main, uh, um, the main technique that we're using is uh, single molecule uh, imaging. And we complement these uh, measurements with um, conventional biochemistry uh, approaches. So when we perform uh, measurements in, in vitro, we look at the conformational changes that are taking place uh, either on the DNA that's being processed or the um, the protein that is performing the function. And uh, we'll see examples of this uh, sh uh, shortly. We also perform experiments in uh, living cells where we can monitor the motion of molecules inside bacteria. Or we can use the power of localizing individual molecules with very high precision to uh, generate uh, high resolution images of biological uh, structures in, in cells. In order to perform these studies, we built our own uh, um, single molecule microscopes, and uh, we have uh, also um, worked on miniaturizing our instrumentation. And in fact, we uh, have uh, even spun out uh, a company that makes a miniaturized single molecule fluorescence microscope called the nanoimager. Now, equipped with the understanding of the biomolecules, the molecular mechanisms and the instrumentation and software, we're also developing biosensors and uh, assays of diagnostic value. So I will be focusing today's talk on uh, the mechanisms of uh, transcription, uh, at least the, the first two parts. So what is uh, transcription? Well, this is the process that allows RNA polymers to read the information of DNA converted into RNA. So that happens during a transcription event. Um, uh, a gene becomes available for the binding of the polymers, starts making RNA. If the RNA uh, is translated by the ribosomes, it can uh, uh, form a, a protein uh, or maybe uh, a stable 
RNA ribosomal RNA. So it will become part of the ribosome. Of course, this is a cartoon version of the process. If we look at the specific case of uh, bacterial uh, transcription, we'll see a complex pathway of binding events and conformational changes. So the machine that will uh, perform transcription will first bind to a protein that will lead it to the right place for the copying of the DNA. And uh, after this initial binding event, um, the DNA will go through conformational changes. It will, uh, discuss this in more detail in the next uh, next few minutes. And, uh, and there is a transcription uh, bubble, an open um, part of the DNA that is formed during the process. And when uh, the nucleotides for the synthesis of uh, RNA uh, are present, then uh, the machine will start making short RNAs. This uh, uh, often tend to dissociate and the system resets back to the open complex and does this. Uh, a few times still it manages to make an RNA that is longer than a certain length and then moves from this initial mode of transcription to the elongation mode of transcription. So uh, this is uh, an example of a pathway that is mirrored in, in other uh, genetic processes, in fact, in other processes that involve uh, protein interactions with, uh, uh, with substrate molecules. So in, in our system, the highlight structures that you see here have been uh, result with uh, high resolution structural biology methods, X-ray crystallography or electron microscopy, but there are a lot of uh, steps that uh, have multiple transitions or they have multiple complexes that is very difficult to synchronize or to isolate and uh, they have not been resolved uh, with um, structural biology methods. Uh, so almost 20 years ago, we started looking at this mechanism with the ambition to actually see it from the perspective of an individual RNA polymers, individual protein, or individual DNA that's being processed. And this way, um, we'll have unique access to the process and the paths and the transitions and the kinetics of all these uh, changes as they happen. And therefore, we can uh, solve the question is how you put all these structural snapshots together these are snapshots that you get from the structural biology methods in order to understand how a process actually works. So you can see here that we have all these uh, pictures of a galloping horse. So what is the sequence of events? Of course, you can cheat and then look at the numbers here and then put it in the right sequence. Um, but the idea is that you, to use our uh, unique uh, single molecule tools that give you access to this trajectory to put these photos in the right sequence and then to play them as a movie so you can visualize the process. And the way we do this at a single molecule level is to identify sites in the machine or the substrate that are, participate uh, in uh, conformational changes and then try to visualize these conformational changes and how fast they, they occur and uh, what is the sequence of, uh, of um, uh, the motions that are taking place. And uh, the tool that we use to do this is um, a, an interaction between fluorophores that is known as fluorescence resonance or first resonance energy transfer that works essentially as a ruler, a dynamic ruler for the nanoscale. So in this, um, uh, in this ruler, you need two fluorophores, one that acts as a donor and another as an acceptor. And when you excite the donor, if the acceptor is in close proximity, within uh, a, a few nanometers, some of this excitation energy is transferred to the acceptor. So when you visualize the emission from these fluorophores, you see low fluorescence from the donor and high from the acceptor. Now, uh, if there's a conformational change that moves the acceptor further away, the efficiency of the uh, fret drops, and now you see mainly the fluorescence from the donor. This is uh, a process that's quite well understood in terms of the distance dependence, and therefore by measuring the energy transfer efficiency, we get information about the distance or between the two probes and uh, the uh, dependence um, of the efficiency to the distance has this very steep uh, dependence because of the power to, uh, to the uh, sixth here. And uh, you can see that there's a characteristic distance that's associated with 50% fret efficiency and then you're very close, you have very high efficiency. When you're far away, you have zero efficiency. And then you have this nice range that you can use to look at, uh, at distances. So now if we zoom in um, at a certain part of this uh, transcription uh, process, um, 
would like to um, basically focus on uh, the, the part of the pathway where the machine opens the DNA to start reading it. And we'd like to understand what is the sequence of motions here. Now, this is an important process. It's, uh, it's important for understanding how transcription is regulated. If you want to model transcription, you have to understand the kinetic um, steps uh, that are, are taking place. And also, it's a point where antibiotics can stop the um, RNA polymerase of, uh, of microbes and therefore uh, act as antibiotics um, that, uh, uh, that kill bacteria. And uh, of course, understanding this process may be useful to do this in higher organisms. So here's a puzzle that we're trying to solve here. Um, RNA polymerase has this, this cleft, this, this opening that is fairly narrow. So there are these two jaws that um, uh, delineate a, a channel uh, in which the DNA needs to bind. But if you look at the width of the DNA, it's actually wider than the opening of this channel. So in order to fit the DNA in this channel, something has to give. The channel needs to open or the DNA needs to be uh, deformed in some fashion in order for the loading to take place or both of these events. And that's uh, the, the puzzle that uh, a brilliant postdoc in my, in my lab, Abhishek Mazunder, is, is trying to solve. Now, um, understanding the mechanism that allows us to see which of the two uh, models that describe the process are, are correct. There's a model that basically uh, says that uh, the mobile element here is the clamp, one of these jaws of the RNA polymers that has to open for the double strand DNA to bind to the bottom of the channel. And that's where it opens. And then the clamp basically closes to lock it in place. So that's a clamp opening model. There is uh, another model that um, uh, suggests that uh, the the DNA opens outside the main channel, and then single strand DNA uh, is uh, much smaller than its double strand counterpart, and then it can bind uh, to, to the channel without the clamp needing to, to open. Now, there are quite a number of issues here. Um, a, a lot of this uh, um, information that led to the models uh, depends on ensemble averaging that cannot uh, uh, clearly identify complex kinetics that have many steps. Uh, and the uh, structural snapshots that gave rise to some of this, uh, um, these models, especially the clam opening model, may actually not be on pathway because um, this is not how the uh, structures are observed. Plus, there may be um, key structures missing. And of course, when we discover a structure, uh, through structural biology, then we try to see whether it fits in this pathway. Um, so therefore here you can see um, a state, a structural state uh, that emerged in 2019 that shows that uh, the, uh, the DNA is uh, in this particular state is open only halfway. So you have this partially uh, open intermediate that may or may not be on, on pathway. So we wanted to address this, um, these conformational changes and to be able to see them in, at a single molecule level. In order to be able to achieve this, we need to be able to see the conformational changes of the clamp, to see, uh, to see it opening and closing where this happens, to be able to see the melting of the DNA, the unwinding and melting of the DNA in real time, and then to try to see these processes as they happen uh, on the way to the final state. So here you can see some of uh, the experiments that were done by a former graduate student in the lab, Diego Ducci, um, by looking at um, the conformation of the, of the clamp, okay, the mobile element that we're interested in. So in order to look at the conformation, again, we place two fluorophores at the tips of um, these jaws of the RNA polymers and the open state of the clamp is, um, was expected to correspond to around 80 angstroms and the closed state to around 70 axioms. So this one nanometer change actually is quite significant for our, uh, our method and uh, is uh, readily observable if it happens. So therefore, we take these uh, proteins, we place them on the surface, and then we just look at their dynamics and see whether we can capture the states. And to be able to do this, uh, we immobilize the complex of the RNA polymers with the DNA on the surface uh, using a series of interactions that anchor it 
on uh, on a surface that we can illuminate with um, uh, with light that gives us an evanescent wave that illuminates uh, only the molecules that are bound to the surface or very close to the surface. So therefore, when we image now uh, a certain area with uh, single molecules, we get images like this, where you get uh, on a camera, where you get uh, bright spots that correspond to the signal of the donor in the green channel and the signal of the acceptor in the red channel. We have ways of uh, aligning the channels in order to see which uh, signal corresponds to, um, in the green corresponds to uh, which signal in, in the red. And when we do this and we plot the intensities, we can actually see the fluctuations in uh, threat efficiency that tell us that we are looking at conformational changes. So you can see here the the green signal going down when the red signal going up. So now we have a high threat state, uh, state where the clamp is, uh, is um, closed and states where this threat efficiency is low, uh, presumably uh, states where the clamp is, is open. Now, it's difficult to assign how many states you have by just um, looking at, uh, at these traces. So we have um, systematic methods to identify the number of states. And actually by looking at many of these uh, traces and analyze them, we identified that there are not two, but three conformational states. One of them being a partially closed state of the clamp. And of course, when we have all these, uh, um, these uh, dwells on the various states, we can get the kinetics for the partial opening, sorry, the partial closing, the full closing and, and vice versa. So we can recapture all this. Uh, all these states. So this has been published, uh, so I'm not going to go uh, through this in, in great detail. Um, but we also showed, apart from the fact that the clamp is dynamic, that you can use antibiotics to either lock the clamp in the open state, lock it in the closed state, or there are small molecules that are important for uh, regulation in bacteria that actually lock it in uh, the um, partially closed state. So um, that was uh, quite uh, quite fascinating, and uh, also this proposes a mode of action for uh, this, uh, this particular antibiotics. And then we saw that uh, after the DNA opens, the clamp remains uh, in the closed state. Okay, so we established now a way of being able to see the motions of the clamp. So what about the opening of the DNA? So how can we do that? Well, for that one, we took advantage of the fact that uh, uh, one of our favorite fluorophores, Psi3, which you can see here, has a different, uh, a very different uh, intensity, very different quantum yield as uh, you move from a double-stranded DNA context to single-stranded DNA. So we see this uh, this huge increase by 120% as you go to single-stranded DNA. So therefore, when we looked at um, this um, uh, transition from the double-stranded uh, DNA to uh, the open complex, we can see this uh, a very large increase indeed um, that then allowed us to go and set up an assay to look at this in real time. So what do we do in this case? So we have the machine on the surface waiting for the DNA to bind. Once the DNA binds, you start seeing uh, a signal appearing. And when the DNA melts and unwinds, your signal becomes brighter. And you can actually see this happening in real time at the single molecule level with millisecond temporary resolution. Here it is. That's the binding event. You're waiting, waiting, waiting. At this point, you can see the melting in real time. Now, this is fascinating because you can actually get the kinetics for melting, and then you know the time scale during which you can start looking at conformational changes from the perspective of the protein in order to time the various events. Okay, and you can do this by looking at molecules that are performing this uh, this uh, motions along the pathway for the opening of the DNA. So here is the results um, that we got for a position that's very close to the downstream end of the bubble, the part that uh, uh, opens last, expected to open last. And uh, when we looked at uh, the time scale for opening for many molecules, we saw that um, this is described by this peak distribution that you see here, that uh, actually implies that we are seeing, uh, in this case, two rate limiting steps that are sequential. And uh, the overall process takes about seven and a half seconds. And one of these processes are fairly fast and the other is slow. Then we ask the question, what happens if we actually place a, a fluorophore at, uh, at the upstream part of the, of the bubble? 
And uh, then we did uh, similar experiments and we saw a, a similar distribution, but now the timing is two seconds shorter. But again, this is a sequential process. So there are, that raised the possibility that you may actually have multiple rate limiting steps when you open the DNA. And we decided to look at this uh, further. And uh, we did an experiment where we increased the GC reach part of the DNA. So this is the, the one that actually uh, that melts more difficult uh, with more difficulty because you have three hydrogen bonds that need to be broken per GC base pair versus uh, an AT base pair. And when we did this um, and performed the same experiment, we saw that the melting time now increases to almost 19 seconds. So we made the, the breaking of the, the bonds in the double strand DNA harder and therefore the machine took longer to open the DNA. And then in order to address the question whether there is a, a two-step process here, we look at what happens for this GC reach promoter if you place the floor four at a position minus nine. So when uh, if uh, the whole thing opens in, in one step, then you expect to get around 19 seconds. If you have multiple steps, it will be much shorter. And that's what we see. We see that um, the melting uh, basically takes only six seconds. So therefore, uh, you have two steps, one that uh, corresponds to the upstream part of the DNA and one to the downstream part. And then depending on how GC you reach, uh, the sequence uh, is in the, in the downstream part, do you have uh, different um, time scales for opening? Then we wanted to answer the question, what happens to the clamp during this, uh, this process? And then we inverted the way we did the experiment. Now we have the DNA on the surface. And uh, when the protein binds, because we have this uh, two floors for frets, we can get information about uh, the status of the clamp. And then we can see whether this changes with, uh, with time or, or not, and whether there is transient opening or closing of the clamp as proposed by one of the models. So here we can see one of these events where the RNA polymerase binds, and we can see that the clamp is actually in the closed state and remains in the closed state. So in no point we can see transient opening and closing of the, of the clamp. And um, uh, when we look at the distribution for the first five frames, we see that the state uh, is the, the closed state of the clamp. But when we look at the, all the frames, we can see that in a large number of the frames, we see two states and the second state corresponds to a, a clamp that's even further closed, a state that we call the locked clamp. It's a new state that we discovered. So therefore, um, we don't see transient opening and uh, the clamp remains closed up to the point that it closes further. And here is, is an example where we can see a binding event waiting to the point that the clamp actually locks. And when we look at the time scale for this, you can see that's about eight seconds. So it matches basically the time scale for the opening of the DNA. So therefore, uh, our interpretation is that you have this two-step opening of the DNA, the unwinding of the DNA, and when this takes place, then the clamp actually locks. So we put it together an updated uh, uh, version of uh, the um, model for the opening of the DNA. So we have initially a binding event, a partial melting that uh, melts the upstream part of the of the DNA. Then full melting takes place. Takes place. The single strand DNA is loaded, and the clamp closes to lock the uh, DNA in place. So therefore, um, that is the case that uh, for a bacterial uh, promoter that has a consensus sequence, uh, it would be very interesting to see how this changes for different, uh, uh, different genes and how this, uh, reg this is regulated by, uh, by proteins and small molecules. And of course, be very interesting to see what happens in different organisms. So, so far, I presented to you an example of a, an in vitro single molecule measurement where we have a lot of control. We can um, modify the surface the way we want. We can link our molecules with uh, sophisticated ways. Or uh, if you do an optical tweezers experiment, for example, you can trap beads with DNA between them and RNA polymers can pull the beads and you measure forces and see single steps. So fascinating, fascinating work, but you're missing the context that comes with the uh, biological um, um, medium of the live organism. And of course, when you have this, you have a lot of complexity. 
You have other biomolecules that may modify what you're studying. There are the processes where your molecule can contribute. There is the macromolecular crowding that, that takes place because of the uh, high concentration of, um, of proteins and other macromolecules in cells. And of course, you have compartments, even in bacteria, that may change uh, the interactions that are taking place. And stochasticity, because many of these molecules like the DNA, exist in very low copy numbers. So there are distributions um, of, uh, of properties that uh, can lead to many different phenotypes in single cells. So we wanted to be able to look at um, single molecules uh, in, um, in single cells. And that was a project that uh, was uh, spearheaded by a former, uh, fantastic former student in, uh, in the group, Matthew Stracy, who looked at uh, how RNA polymers moves inside bacterial cells. So when the RNA polymers is searching for a gene, it's taking long steps. It's diffusing actually fairly rapidly, but when it binds to the DNA and copies its information, it is essentially immobile or it moves extremely slowly. So therefore by just looking at the mobility of the RNA polymers, we can see um, basically where, uh, where it is where the genes that are transcribed uh, are in, in the cell. So, and to be able to do this, we used a, a, a property that has been uh, um, exploited in single uh, uh, molecule super resolution methods where you can photoactivate the molecule. You can observe it for a short time and then you, uh, you bleach it, you lose it. Uh, and that's important because if you want to look at um, all the RNA polymers in a bacterial cell at the same time when they're in an on fluorescent state, then you just see a blurry image. You don't see a single molecule because there are 3000 of them. And here you can see the image of a single molecule in a single bacterial cell. But if you just turn only one of these molecules on at any given time, you see an image like this and then the molecule may move or may actually appear stationary. So therefore, every time you do this, here's a, an example of a movie, you can see um, a molecule here, you can see that the molecule moves uh, fairly, um, fairly significantly, and then it bleaches. And every time you get a track, and then you can put all these tracks in, in single cells. So you can see hundreds or thousands of molecules in single uh, living bacterial cells. And that can give you lots of information. It can give you some idea of the copy number, how many proteins of a certain kind you have in, in a cell, and you can look at the distribution in single cells. You can look at the, where the molecules are in the cell and how they're moving about, and um, where they are relative to other proteins or other structures in, in the cell. And also you can, uh, by looking at the mean square displacement, the uh, index of mobility of molecules versus time, you can see how mobile they are and also get some information about uh, the um, their containment um, that will be uh, witnessed by this saturation in this particular plot. And the other thing that is fascinating is that, that you can actually monitor as molecules are moving and then see um, when they're binding to a certain uh, target, how long they stay, and therefore you get information about timing and, and the presence of the targets in cells. So um, in the case of RNA polymers, we Perform these measurements, we look at, uh, you see here, many, many trajectories, 70,000 trajectories, and we've got this wide distribution that can be fit by uh, two distributions. And we do this because we understand this red distribution very well from control experiments. So that we can see that about half of the molecules are bound and half are uh, diffusing. So these are, again, these are the molecules that are transcribing or binding to the DNA. That's our interpretation, and half of this uh, uh, or the total molecules are searching for the genes. And what is fascinating is that if you use a certain threshold to color your tracks, either red for not moving fast or blue, you can see that distribution is very, very different. You can see that the molecules of diffusion seem to be uh, centrally located and occupying what you expect the, um, the region you expect that uh, will be occupied by the chromosome. And the red uh, molecules seem to crown essentially this structure. And these are the ones that uh, you expect that um, I will be, will be copying the DNA into RNA. 
If we now put an antibiotic in, uh, in the cells that uh, basically stops uh, this uh, process and just keeps the molecules that are on, uh, on the promoter, you can see that the distribution changes massively and uh, as you expect, and this actually uh, gives you an opportunity to see how antibiotics function and also to see whether um, some cells are resistant to antibiotics because uh, this is expected to, uh, to give you a very different profile. So how does this uh, distribution that we see for these proteins that interact in DNA actually compares to the uh, location of the DNA in cells. So here, this information from a single cell, we can stain the DNA in live bacterial cells, and we can look at the location of the mobile RNA polymerases. And you can see here that uh, the mobile polymers essentially stain the DNA perfectly. It's almost like a DNA stain. So this is not a fit. This is actually a superimposed image, uh, superimposed uh, curve of the DNA on the distribution of the RNA polymers. And something similar here also if you project on, uh, on the, uh, the x-axis and the short axis. However, when you look at the bound polymerases that expected to transcribe genes, you can see that, that the profile is very different. Now you can see that um, the polymerases tend to be in the periphery of, uh, of the DNA and the nucleoid. And uh, this is something we've seen uh, when we looked at uh, uh, hundreds of, of cells, basically this recapitulated the, the fundamental um, picture that we get from a single cell. We also wanted to see whether we can perturb this uh, distribution by changing the, um, the amount of DNA in a cell and the, um, and the region that it covers. So you can use mutant uh, E. coli cells that um, uh, replicate uh, DNA less and you can condense their DNA and therefore you can concentrate the DNA in this part of the cell and leave these ends, the end caps as we call them, um, free of DNA. And now what you can do, first you can see how this compares to the cells that uh, have not been perturbed and you can see that uh, the uh, polymers becomes a lot more mobile so all this bound population uh, decreases very significantly. And the other thing that you can do, and I'm always fascinated by this result, you can actually look at diffusion only at this part of the cell that uh, is uh, free of DNA. And when you do this, you can see the diffusion is much faster. So, uh, and if you do corrections um, that account from the, from the fact that uh, you have um, containment of these molecules, uh, in, in a cell and there is some, some error for localization precision, you can see that uh, in the absence of the DNA, diffusion of RNA polymers is fairly fast, but in the presence is much slower, which suggests that actually 85% of the time when the polymerase is, is searching is spent non-specifically bound to, to the DNA. So we pursued this uh, further recently and, uh, and looked at the behavior of, of many uh, DNA binding proteins that have different functions, but all work uh, one way or another on the DNA. Because the DNA uh, for these proteins is, uh, is doing many things. It's the reaction substrate. So for, for example, if there is DNA damage, there is a protein that will recognize the damage and fix it. But it's also the search path, because it's been shown that uh, the DNA binding proteins are searching, binding non-specific DNA and perform searches in order to find their target. And then of course, it's a, it's a mesh. It's, uh, it's like um, a, a sort of basket uh, that needs to be, uh, to be explored and uh, can, can act as, a, um, as a, an obstacle to, to diffusion. So here is an example of various proteins that uh, interact with different types of substrates. Uh, you can see here, we covered RNA polymers. DNA polymers one, for example, will bind to a gapped DNA substrate and then different uh, binding proteins will uh, bind to different types of, of DNA. But in all cases that we examined, we examined 11 such uh, proteins in a paper that were just published in molecular cell. You, you see uh, two populations. One population that appears to be bound stably to, um, to the chromosome, and one that contains both the non-specific DNA binding and a certain fraction of diffusion of the DNA. So like three-dimensional diffusion of the DNA 
and then non-specific binding the DNA. So that's what we see again and again for all the DNA binding proteins. So we wanted to see whether we can find a way to look at DNA free diffusion without having to play the tricks of, of basically coming up with bacteria that have uh, uh, minimal DNA. And to do this, we introduced uh, two sites on the DNA where um, the protein can bind, make cuts, and then uh, um, another protein will digest the DNA. So this way, you can actually digest um, the DNA in, in about 90% of the cells within 90 minutes. So therefore you have lots, of, uh, lots and lots of bacteria that have no DNA. Now you can monitor the diffusion of this bacteria and then get the how um, RNA polymerase diffuses in the absence of any any DNA and uh, the absence of the chromosome. So now all this distribution that contains uh, these two species, the bound and the diffusion, become distributions that have only one species. And now this species is actually very fast because it represents only the three-dimensional diffusion of these proteins in bacterial cells. And having these numbers, the diffusion coefficients and the relative abundance allows us to calculate the fraction of, um, of the time that these proteins are bound, are, are um, not specifically bound to the DNA. And as you see here, these three examples uh, is, is always over 50%. So therefore the non-specific binding of the DNA dominates the search process for these uh, proteins to, to find their targets. And here you can see how um, when we plot the diffusion uh, behavior, diffusion uh, coefficient, um, of these uh, 11 proteins versus their molecular weight, we can see that there is no, uh, no trend, uh, not, not the trend that we're expecting if we just look at the uh, be behavior um, as described by the Stokes-Einstein uh, law that uh, predicts the diffusion coefficient as a function of the molecular uh, weight and uh, the, uh, the, viscosity of, uh, the viscosity of the medium and uh, the uh, radius um, and, and the, the density of the, of the protein. Um, so in the case, however, that we look at the DNA free cells, we can see um, a linear relation now that the DNA has been, uh, has been removed. So there's a good match to the Stokes-Steins uh, law, but um, the exponent here, instead of being uh, basically one third, basically a cubic root of uh, this uh, factor here is, uh, 0.75, which means that even when you digest the DNA, there's other stuff in the cytoplasm inside cells that slow down uh, diffusion and, and cause uh, uh, effects uh, uh, that uh, resemble CV. So just to conclude this uh, part of the talk, so I showed you how we can use this tracking of single molecules to get the spatial distribution of mobility. I showed the importance of this non-specific interaction, both for RNA polymers and uh, um, for uh, other DNA binding proteins. And I also showed you that, that the um, polymerases that are performing transcription are actually moving at the periphery of the nucleoid. And I, I didn't cover the presence of clustered RNA polymers due to the lack of time. Now, I uh, only have uh, a few minutes, so I'll go through quickly some work that we've done on uh, viruses using single molecule uh, imaging uh, methods. That's the uh, uh, work of uh, two brilliant uh, people. Um, that uh, worked uh, in, in my lab, Nicole Robb, who was a former uh, fellow in the group, and now she's uh, uh, an associate professor at the Work University. And Nicolas uh, Cialis, uh, a brilliant undergraduate, now graduate student in, in the group. And the idea is to, to use the power of single molecule imaging combined with uh, deep learning to be able to, um, to detect viruses and identify them rapidly. So the whole project started with the ambition to be able to detect viruses uh, through an interaction with uh, molecules that bite specifically to the surface of um, enveloped viruses. And here you can see a cartoon of the flu virus. So the idea was the following. If you have a molecule like an antibody or an aptamer that binds to one of the surface proteins of um, the flu virus and look at the diffusion, of this um, labeled particle, you expect this to diffuse slowly because the particle is fairly large. The diameter is 120 nanometers. 
However, if you don't have uh, particles, then the antibodies will move extremely quickly. And therefore, um, you will see a very, very different signal. So in the process of actually doing this work, we discovered a new interaction between single-stranded DNA and the uh, uh, envelope of these viruses that's mediated by calcium ions. And this is non-specific, so therefore it can work with any envelope virus. And uh, in order to be able to visualize the particles, we, we use the approaches as similar to the ones that we uh, use to study diffusion in bacteria. Um, the particles are labeled so we can track them. And then with tracking analysis, we get information about their diffusion and therefore about their size. So, and this is how the movies look. So you add basically calcium chloride, high concentrations and fluorescent DNA. And with one minute, you get basically the viruses uh, appearing and, and diffusing. And then you have lots and lots of events that you can uh, analyze. First, uh, we show that the signal is very specific. So if you don't have virus or calcium chloride DNA, or you remove the calcium ions, you get nothing. But if you have this, uh, uh, this interacting components, you get lots of particles, you can track them, you can see here some of the tracked viruses, and then you can recover the dimensions of the virus particle, and you can count the viral particles. And this is very fast, as I said, um, you add the virus, a sample that contains the virus in a solution of calcium chloride DNA, you mix up and down, you, you put on the on a, a well on top of the microscope and record movies. And even within one minute, you get lots and lots of events. And then you can see here how the number of particles that you detect changes with time. Within one minute, you, you have more than 50% of the signal. So it's very, very rapid. Then we try to analyze the mechanism of the uh, interaction. We saw that uh, the binding is specific to calcium. It uh, worked best with DNA molecules, but RNA also showed a uh, signal. And um, you require a minimum length of 20 nucleotides or longer. And very importantly, the charge for the interaction needs to be negative. So when we uh, did experiments with uh, neutral or cationic vesicles to simulate uh, uh, viral particles, basically we got no signal whatsoever. So therefore, our interpretation is that you have this, um, um, in, in this case, you have this negatively charged uh, virus uh, envelope and the negatively charged phosphates of the DNA and calcium basically acts as a bridge to put many of these fluorophores on the surface to make them very bright so you can detect them very quickly. You can do this also on the surface uh, by placing uh, molecules on the surface, you can use antibodies that label them on one color and the DNA is on another color. You can capture these particles on the surface and then you can do um, two color uh, microscopy to be able to see the particles. So we concluded the work and we published it in uh, November, 2019 in scientific reports. And then as we all know, our life changed in 2020 because another envelope virus came uh, into prominence and made us all uh, very, very miserable. Uh, it's uh, SARS-CoV-2. So we wanted to see then whether we can use our method for labeling and another method that was developed to do um, virus identification to be able to detect and classify um, CoV-2 particles. Now, that was important because if you look at uh, the topography and sizes of um, um, non of common coronaviruses that cause a human, uh, uh, to humans uh, just a common cold, and influenza, you can see that the, the topography and the, um, and the sizes are fairly similar. So therefore we needed something to be able to tell subtle differences between the properties of, this, of these particles. And that's where Nicholas came um, because um, Nicholas was working on finding ways to use deep learning to tell the difference between different strains of influenza by um, using imaging and, uh, and machine learning. So this is, this is the uh, idea that was uh, promoted by Nicholas. So let's say they have two viruses with, um, with different size and with different surface properties. When you label them with this uh, calcium labeled method and you place them on the surface, you can image 
and get individual signals from individual particles. Now you can feed them in a deep learning network where you of course have labeled the particles from virus X in a certain way. And, um, uh, and then you also annotated the other virus with uh, um, that corresponds to to uh, the, the different virus in a different way. And then you feed this in a convolutional neural network that then uh, basically tunes its parameters in order to recognize specifically the particles from a different virus. And when you do this and you have trained your network, you can have unknown samples that uh, can be examined by the trained network. And then every particle will be classified either as virus X or virus Y with a certain probability. And of course, because you have many, many particles in samples, then you can uh, also uh, identify the particle, the, sorry, the sample that contains these uh, multiple particles. So the experiments are fairly similar to the ones I described uh, uh, before. Again, mobilize the uh, uh, particles on, on the surface and two color imaging um, for two DNAs that are binding to the viral particles. So we do this uh, uh, with uh, a, an animal coronavirus, um, chicken coronavirus, and we can we do this also with, uh, with also controls. And then we have ways of identifying the particles that uh, are co-localized and therefore are likely to correspond to, to viral particles. And then we will have some uh, similar particles in a negative uh, control that we need to uh, differentiate from. It's a very fast process. Here you can see uh, the microscope scanning from field of view to field of view. So this is in real time. So you can basically get tens of thousands of particles in just uh, it's a couple of minutes in automated fashion. So when we did these measurements now with uh, with uh, different uh, viral particles with uh, and um, with a negative control, we could see that if you look at the various properties of the image, like the maximum intensity, the area of the particle, and also the asymmetry of the particle, then we can see subtle uh, but uh, clear differences between uh, um, between viruses and the negative control. And that's what then is used by the uh, network to be able to classify um, the, the particles um, as, a, as a positive or negative or as, as belonging to one, viruses, uh, one virus versus another. And in order to evaluate the performance of the, uh, the network, you have to prepare this uh, confusion matrix as it's called, where this is the actual a property of a certain particle, and this is what is output by the by the network. And clearly, the best performance is to um, to get very high true positives and true negatives because this will correspond to high sensitivity and high specificity. So, um, this analysis is done for different particles, and the probability reflects just one of these particles. But when you have a clinical sample, for example, you have many, many particles. So therefore, uh, if, you, uh, if you use a, this, this images, then you can call the clinical sample with, uh, with high accuracy. So, but when you look at the particle uh, level, uh, here you can see that uh, in the case of the, of the animal coronavirus, we can tell the difference from a negative control with uh, very, very high validation uh, accuracy, over 90%. This is a lab-grown strain, however. When you go to clinical samples that clearly they're more uh, complex and we compare uh, the coronavirus, the, anim the uh, common human coronaviruses with a negative control, we get a validation accuracy that approaches 80%. That's again per particle, not per sample. And even in the case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, clinical samples, we get a 70% uh, validation uh, accuracy, but again, this is per particle. So I'm emphasizing this per particle because if you look, let's say at a sample that uh, has been shown to be positive by RT-PCR and uh, you perform our assay, you will have many, many particles. So these particles in this positive sample has been classified as 148 being positive and 25 as being negative. So therefore, if you, if you look at the probability um, of this particular sample being positive, you can see the probability is extreme, sorry, extremely high, and uh, 
uh, vice versa, the probability of a sample that has only 25 out of 173 being negative uh, is, um, um, is uh, very, very low in terms of being negative. So therefore, this way we can identify and call the samples being positive or, or negative. So um, I'm almost done. Just to conclude this part of the, the talk, I showed you um, how cation-mediated labeling can uh, um, can detect viruses very, very quickly. And uh, our deep learning approach that uh, can, uh, can uh, achieve over 90% accuracy per, per particle, um, still working on improving this, uh, this accuracy. The detection, of course, is very fast. What we're trying to do now is to determine the sensitivity and specificity for a large number of clinical samples. Uh, we're trying to see whether we can uh, capture different variants with this method and, and trying to, um, to develop a, an affordable, an affordable um, detector to be able to, to do this analysis. This is something that's pursued very heavily by Nicholas and, and Nicole. Um, and um, of course, this is something that's not limited to coronavirus and, and can be used to, uh, to detect other viruses. So I'll uh, end here. I will thank uh, my wonderful group that made uh, all this uh, work possible. Uh, especially Abhishek, who contributed uh, in the in vitro analysis of uh, the transcription initiation mechanism, Nicole and Nicolas, who uh, spearheaded the efforts on viral detection, and Matt Strace and Stepan Upov, uh, who did the wonderful work on um, um, single molecules of DNA binding proteins in bacteria. And uh, if you're interested in joining our group, we have a postdoc opening on deep learning approaches to look at antimicrobial resistance detection. So I'll stop here and I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this very exciting and intriguing talk. Now, uh, if you go over into the question answer session, please ask questions. Send in a message through chat button or just raise your hand. Achilles, I have a question. You you have sure, uh, very nicely explained indeed uh, how to distinguish between different viruses. The method, of course, is universal by, by nature. Fluorescence spectroscopy, a single molecule imaging. But you, at the end, mentioned also about variants. So the same virus, not different virus, but the same virus with mutations. How does this work for, for, for this case? Can, can you now, for example, detect using these methods some variation? You, you, you know, of course, uh, African <laughs> variants or uh, England variants or Brazilian <laughs> variants of COVID yeah. coronavirus. Can you distinguish between them using this method? So, you know, you, you wouldn't necessarily expect that this is going to work necessarily, but uh, the way that uh, the work had started was by looking at different, uh, different strains of, of flu that, again, you don't expect them to be hugely different, but there was very good discrimination between uh, different, different strains of flu. So when uh, uh, variants uh, start appearing, um, then that was something that was, uh, that was tested, uh, in, in the lab and some, some discrimination has been shown. I mean, again, this is work in, in progress. Now the variants uh, uh, may have different charge distribution and different behavior uh, in terms of um, the, the interactions between, between particles. And uh, this, is, um, this is something that uh, is, uh, seems to be being picked up by, by deep learning. So, so therefore there is some, some discrimination and then you can change the conditions to try to increase the, the difference that the initial difference that, uh, that you, you see. Yeah. Well, this is gonna be usable as, a, as an actual way of being able to tell the difference at a large scale uh, for clinical samples. I mean, that remains to, to be seen. No question, please. We have
have one question in chat. Achilles, can you read them? Uh, let me see. Uh... Uh, question about bacteria. Can known bacteria develop resistance so that known antibiotics for them become ineffective? Uh, yes, uh, they very much can do this. And uh, this is one, uh, uh, one of the major problems that uh, we will be facing, we're facing now, and that we'll be facing uh, even more the, uh, the years to come if we don't take uh, action. Right now, there are 700,000 deaths a year in the world because of uh, the microbial resistance. So, so for, you know, you go to, uh, you go to the doctor, they prescribe antibiotics and they're ineffective. And if this happens in uh, uh, diseases where the, uh, the effects of antibiotics need to, uh, to take place very, very quickly, like in the case of uh, septicemia and sepsis, then uh, the, uh, the results can be, can be catastrophic. And because we are overusing antibiotics, especially broad range antibiotics, um, because it's, it's simpler for the doctors to prescribe and it's faster, then essentially we are um, uh, helping bacteria to develop resistance. And, uh, and therefore um, we need to do something in terms of being able to detect their resistance and then develop new antibiotics because otherwise the numbers will uh, go from 700,000 that we have today to uh, to 10 million by 2050 if no action is taken. So another thing to, to worry about, but uh, there are many, many groups uh, that are, are working from different perspectives to make sure that this doesn't happen. And as I say that some of the techniques that we, are, uh, we have been developing for coronavirus came from the the need to develop better ways of, of detecting antibiotic resistance. But now that we have gotten better in some of these techniques because of the pandemic, now we'll go back and use these improved tools to, to look at how we can tackle resistance in bacteria. More question, please. Probably getting getting late for some of the people. It's been uh, the time is there, so eight eight something. Mm -hmm. and so. so, if no more question, to uh, what do you think, Achilles? Can you stop? Can we stop here? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, right. Thanks, uh, yeah, thanks for attending uh, the the talk. Questions. Your questions. Okay. Okay. This this is indeed not question. Uh, thanking you for for excellent talk. So uh, mm -hmm. I agree with, with this question. So is there Thank another scientific questions? Uh, so it seems to me that no questions. So if you don't mind, we can stop here. Yeah, no so, worries. And, uh, thank you if very much is... once again. That was very, very excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our website is available in case that uh, people are curious to find out more. Yeah, yeah. So um, stay well and, uh, and see you sometime in the future. Take care. You too. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.